So today I would like to focus on showing you a product demo. Uh, before doing that, I'll start by introducing myself, then introducing backslash, um, and talking about the main challenges that we want to overcome, and then diving into the actual product uh, demo, ending with the uh, questions and answers. Um, so let's start. So my name is Amit Bismuth. I'm the head of product at Backlash Security. And I like to uh, define myself as a professional uh, guitar player for the last 20 years, playing in different uh, bands. Um, I'm also an intermediate uh, snowboard surfer and uh, a hobbyist uh, home cook, mostly uh, since COVID time. Um, in my career, for the last 10 years, I've been doing product management for cybersecurity products. Prior to that, I was doing um, some hands-on uh, penetration testing. And as a product manager, I led web application firewall uh, products. Later on, um, cloud security products involving containers, Kubernetes, eBPF technology, uh, CSPMs, and everything in between. And I'm trying to balance all of that with the fact that I have a one-year-old uh, baby girl. And uh, that's a little bit about myself. Um, so let's, let's understand what we do in Backslash. So Backslash is a company that deals with application security, and we are focused on uh, security posture. We chose um, to address this problem by scanning the application code specifically. Um, we believe that this is the right way to, uh, to be very efficient. We analyze the code and give all the different uh, findings that we find so that you could fix it in the, uh, in the source. Uh, so it's a very actionable approach. With this approach, there are different challenges that we currently see in the industry. So let's start with the first challenge. So the first challenge is that tools that um, exist in the market already and are trying to do that, uh, statically analyze the code of the application and all the dependencies it has. Um, but the, uh, in reality, uh, in 89% of the times, they provide inaccurate results. 89% um, of the times, they provide inaccurate results. So this is a very strong statement. Uh, imagine that you had a car and in 89% of the times it wouldn't start. I wouldn't drive this car, I would just walk probably. So let's try to understand why this number, why 89? So whenever you add um, a package uh, to a project, to a software, your developers declare about this package in, in a file, in a manifest file, it could be a POM, uh, POM XML file or a requirement file if it's Python. Um, and this file has the list of packages that your project needs. But it seems that in, in most cases, those packages also have dependencies and their dependencies also have dependencies. We call these dependencies transitive packages or trans transitive uh, 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 packages or dependencies. And that's because they're not being added directly to the project. Um, so the vendors that create these inaccurate results basically assume that you are using all these packages. They assume that all their vulnerabilities are a risk to your application, even though you might not really use any of them. You might only use the direct package or only some of the packages they would automatically assume that you're using all of them and surface a lot of uh, issues and a lot of create a lot of work for you. Um, the day-to-day -day, uh, issue here is that security professionals uh, rely on these tools uh, to uh, as the main tool for security posture, and they ask their developers to fix issues. And at the end of the day, a developer is tasked with fixing such issue, uh, replacing a package with a newer version only to find out that all the work that he did um, didn't really uh, affect the application because his application doesn't actually use the package, uh, which creates a loss of trust in the tool, in the process, and in the security professionals. And eventually, when we talk with, uh, with developers, they just say that they're not using the tools. 
they are just walking uh, and not driving the vehicle. Uh, so that's a problem that we're trying to solve. And in order to solve that, we have to not only analyze very in a very shallow way, we also need to analyze the transitive packages with the direct packages and with the context of the code to analyze their code and see whether the application is actually using those packages. Only once we do that, we get what we call reachability. But is it enough? So my claim is that it's not enough. So even if uh, we have reachability, which says that the application code is actually using the vulnerable code, um, it doesn't mean, uh, it's, it's not a full picture. It's not a full uh, uh, attack path. And we need to stop thinking like developers for a moment and st start thinking like attackers. Um, so uh, for attacker to be able to exploit a vulnerability, it has to be somehow uh, exposed to the network. Um, in most cases, like in 95% of the critical CVSS vulnerabilities, they have a network attack vector uh, that's based on that. So uh, the full uh, the full reachability is having external reachability. So whenever we know that something is reachable, we need to ask reachable by whom. And external reachability tells us that uh, uh, a vulnerable code is being exposed somehow externally to the network, which means that uh, there is a risk. Uh, so this is the second challenge. And uh, now let's see how we do it in backslash. So we start by connecting to your uh, SEM, uh, where you host your code. It could be GitHub, GitLab, uh, Bitbucket, or any other popular uh, repository. Uh, we then analyze your code. We don't require any agents to be deployed in your environment in runtime. Uh, you don't have to contact your uh, infrastructure team. Uh, there is no instrumentation involved. You don't have to change your code. Uh, there is no artifact needed. You don't need to build the code and uh, test it like uh, the approach being done with uh, dynamic scanning, uh, dust. So we simply connect to the code and we start the process from that point, which make it an ideal process and a, an ideal solution for security professionals uh, without being dependent on any other uh, person in the organization. From that moment, we analyze the application code. We have a deep proprietary technology uh, which analyzes the code for finding different uh, application flows and data flows from the application. Then we analyze the application for different vulnerabilities. We do this part uh, natively. We don't rely on any external engines. And lastly, we prioritize all the findings by connecting the dots. Only if we find that there is a vulnerability that has a flow uh, from, uh, from the outside to the uh, vulnerability, we then prioritize it as external reachable vulnerability. Um, so without further ado, let's see them. Okay, so in this screen, you can see a list of vulnerabilities. Um, this is the uh, list of vulnerabilities you would find on products like SEA. It's the uh, OSS vulnerabilities related to the packages your application is using. And uh, you can see that there is a, co a column here, the third one called reachability. And um, when we filter the, reach the reachable vulnerabilities, it reduced the number from 350 to um, to around 100 vulnerabilities. So only 100 are actually being used in this uh, application. Uh, you can scroll the list and see the different vulnerabilities. You can prioritize them by different attributes. Uh, let's just pick one. And let's understand what it means when we say that it's reachable. So this is the evidence that we show. And we can see that um, we, in the context of this specific microservice, we analyze the code of the microservice, and we found a specific method or a function in the uh, application that is calling the direct package, which eventually reaches the vulnerable package. And uh, this is a strong evidence showing that your application is indeed using this vulnerable package, and you should triage this vulnerability and eventually fix it. 
Um, this is not the only uh, way that this uh, package could reach your application. There are multiple uh, transitive paths that uh, exist and we check all of them. Um, so let me just scroll here. So in this example, we show that we have found a function that calls the direct package, but there is no further link to the other packages. So um, the direct package is getting called, it's getting reached, but it doesn't uh, reaching the it doesn't reach the vulnerable package. Um, so we need to to have at least one reachable path to make the the vulnerability and the package reachable. And this is what we're doing in this specific example. Um, so we've seen reachability and. Uh, at Backslash, we do that for all the packages, not only the direct packages. We analyze all the packages to see if they are indeed using the uh, the vulnerable uh, um, code and uh, from the application in the context of the application. So the second thing that I would like to show you, I will demonstrate on our code vulnerabilities module. Uh, in the code vulnerabilities, you would see uh, vulnerabilities found in the actual code that we scan, not in the uh, packages. Uh, you can see issues like OS command injection in this list. Um, you can see uh, past reversal, uh, XML uh, external entity, prototype pollutions, and, and some other um, uh, types of risks. Uh, I will pick the very uh, uh, common and uh, classic example of SQL injection. Um, so we can see that we have a uh, SQL injection, there is a pattern in the code that basically says that there is an issue here, right? We have a vulnerability. Um, and you can see that this list is quite big, right? We have a few hundreds, 600 in this case, uh, list of vulnerabilities. Uh, but what we are doing here is uh, basically also um, analyzing the flows in the code. And only if we see that there is a flow from uh, an external network entity, we then prioritize it. And in this case, we haven't found any. So we've basically ruled them out and reduced the severity to low. And we found that there are only 40 uh, vulnerabilities that have external reachability. So let's pick one and see how it looks like. In this case, we can see that there is a, a SQL injection vulnerability. We can see all the information about the vulnerability, the code snippet. And we can also see the reachability analysis for this specific vulnerability and how from the internet through a specific API, uh, we can eventually reach the service with the vulnerability and uh, exploit a database, a very specific database. We can see the information about the API um, and the parameter that is the payload that attackers could actually uh, attack and use uh, to exploit this specific vulnerability which gives uh, first a uh, reduction in number. So we've seen reduc reduction from 600 to 40, which is a really uh, uh, great uh, reduction rate. And also we give a very crisp evidence to the developer that gets this uh, vulnerability um, that uh, really convince uh, the developers to actually fix it. This is not uh, a false positive. Um, so just imagine that a developer will get this list of 600 and try randomly to pick one of them to, to find that it's not, not reachable, it's not relevant, it's not, not a risk. After a few attempts, it would probably uh, stop using the tool. Um, so by doing this reduction, we also make sure that developers get a more, uh, a, a more uh, a high quality result. Um, so we've seen the reachability that we do for the open source packages, and we've seen the reachability that we do for code vulnerabilities, uh, where we find them and uh, find the path uh, from the external entity to the vulnerable code. Um, a bonus feature is that for the uh, open source vulnerabilities, we can also export this data in a standard format called VEX. VEX is a format related to the cycle on the X which is under the umbrella of uh, SBOM, Software Bill of Material. Basically, there are some regulations that are going to be enforced on 2024 uh, by May that require some organizations to be more transparent about the packages that they have and uh, providing this information in a standard format, in a, a standard JSON format. 
Um, so the use case there is to basically hand this information uh, to a consumer of the application, which in most cases, if you're familiar with such use case, the end user, the consumer, uh, is starting a conversation around which vulnerability or which package is vulnerable and asking the um, the uh, the provider to fix these vulnerabilities and replace these packages. And this creates a back and forth process. So by having the VEX format, we include all the information about the vulnerabilities as well to the packages, and we automatically classify them for reachable and unreachable, uh, saving all this energy of uh, doing manual process and handing this information.